Hi, my name is Mark Jansky. I'm the coordinator of the Reform Baptist Network. And this is another Net Talk installation. Uh, Net Talk is a podcast where we discuss kingdom themes that dovetail together with the purpose of RBNet. In fact, our purpose in RBNet is glorifying God through fellowship and cooperation and fulfilling the Great Commission to the ends of the earth. And there's that great hope text that we have of Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's our pleasure to have with us today uh, Pastor Rob Ventura. Uh, Rob is the pastor of Grace Community Church in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Rob, actually, concerning RBNet, he's going to be attending for the first time our RBNet GA in Greenville, South Carolina. That's September 18 to 21. There we'll have uh, speakers like uh, Vody Bauckham and Steve Pettit and Joey Piper and Sam Masters. You can, you can check our website. If you want to even register, there's still time. You can do that right there at reformbaptistnetwork.com. So we have with us here uh, Rob Ventura, who's written a new book. It's called Expository Outlines and Observations on Romans, subtitle, Hints and Helps for Preachers and Teachers. Now, Rob, just by way of background, Rob is one of the pastors, as I said, of Grace Community Church in Providence, Rhode Island. He's a co-author of A Portrait of Paul and Spiritual Warfare. He's also the gener general editor of Going Beyond the Five Points, and Covenant Theology, and a new exposition of the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. That's really going to be a useful work in the kingdom, I think, Rob. He's Thank also you. contributed articles to journals and periodicals, and also the Reformation Heritage King James Study Bible. So this, this, this book that Paul ha, that uh, Rob has just put out uh, is by Mentor. Uh, it is, excuse me, the, 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 the 1689 London's Baptist Confession is by Mentor, but this is by Christian Focus, and it's uh, 448 pages. It's a hardcover. I think it's $25 retail, and there's a forward by Steve Lawson. Rob, good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. I know Jack Buckley is your fellow elder there. He is. It's been a joy for me to be able to be there with you in Providence. There's a thriving congregation. I think uh, in many ways as a pastor, the boundary lines have fallen for you in pleasant places there. Oh, yeah. We're very grateful and thankful to be laboring with Jack for 16 years now. So real blessing. And I didn't mention that your helpmate, your wife, Vanessa, who was really the mighty woman behind the mighty man, maybe the mightier woman, uh, she's been a great blessing. I know Diane has really enjoyed the relationship with Vanessa. And uh, whatever you are and the Lord has made you to be, I think it can primarily be attributed to Vanessa. Indeed, she is the crown to my head. Uh, well said, well said. Okay, so, so let's talk about this book. Uh, the description of the book is, uh, Rob Ventura mines the rich doctrinal truths of the book of Romans and offers quick, accessible, expository nuggets for preachers and teachers. Uh, each segment really highlights, so there's a central theme, and then there's a, a homiletical outline. Then there are exegetical and practical insights. And then applications for believers. And I think something quite unique, Rob, applications for unbelievers. Just, just mm -hmm. a little more summary here. Uh, the exegesis of the original Greek is presented clearly without being highly technical. And readers are aided by their journey uh, through some of the church's history's finest, including Luther and Calvin and Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones. And it's labeled as an excellent addition to any preacher's study. 
as this book will enrich your preaching and cause your heart to marvel anew at the astounding grace of God. Any, any comments on that, just generally speaking? Well, much could be said about it. That is a nice summary of, of the book. So when I was preaching through Romans uh, several years ago, I actually went through about 140 commentaries, and I read those every week. And um, Romans is a well-served book. There are a ton of good, good commentaries on Romans. Uh, again, I've got actually list in my commentary, my top 30 evangelical uh, commentaries, beginning with John Murray and uh, Douglas Moo and Schreiner and Leon Morris, etc. And so with Romans, there's a plethora of good scholarly works for our use as pastors, really good stuff. However, what I didn't find in all these excellent volumes was, uh, or I could say were the things that I actually thought this needs to be done. I'm preaching every week through Romans. Time is short. Uh, I need quick, accessible uh, um, uh, opening into the Greek text uh, with the truths right there, as opposed to reading, uh, again, long pages and long discourses on uh, various verbs, etc., and their uses. I needed outlines for my weekly prep. Uh, homiletical outlines, alliterated outlines, if I can get them. And I needed applications for sermons every week. And all of the commentaries that I used, really none of them, maybe Matthew Henry give me some uh, good applications here and there, and Matthew Poole and maybe William Burkett. But out of the 140, it was just uh, a lot of labor to study through Romans and to get stuff done every week, especially if I was preaching two sermons. Now, of course, as pastors and preachers, we're called to labor in the Word of God and in doctrine. That's what we do, of course. But with all of these commentaries, I just thought they're giving me a lot of information, but they're not really helpful for me as a preacher, especially homiletically, pre uh, homiletically speaking. So as I started writing my sermons, I wrote them with a view to getting some type of book together whereby preachers after me can get quick access to the Greek language with the nuances therein, nice preaching outlines and nice applications, as you said, not only for the believer, but also for the unbeliever, because I trust in all of our sermons, we want to uh, lovingly go after unbelievers, exhorting them to come to Christ for life and salvation. So out of those things uh, was born this commentary. And as far as guys who have been uh, looking into the chapters and, and reading it and sampling it, they just say, hands down, best thing for the preacher. Uh, not that it's better than a Murray or a Moo or Leon Morris, uh, of course not. But when it comes to what we do week in and week out, this is the tool. Phil Johnson actually compared it to Spurgeon's Treasury of David. So, you know, you could have so many uh, commentaries on the Psalms. I've got probably 60 commentaries on the Psalms. But if you want some good insights, some good outlines, and some good applications, you go to Treasury of David, you crack it open, and there it is. It gets your homiletical juices flowing, and you're already thinking sermonically. So, uh, that really is the heartthrob of my new work. Just here. That's what I thought when I looked at your commentary and just considered your content there. It did. It, it reminded me of the Treasury of David, how Spurgeon will have sections on exposition, then explanatory notes and quaint sayings. Yes. And hints to preachers. Yeah. So helpful in working with the Psalms. It, it kind of reminds me too, your commentary on Charles Hodge when Hodge would have analysis, mm. have commentary, then you'd have doctrine, then you'd have remarks. Exactly. I, I found your work to be in that tradition, which was so mm. helpful to me, both in dealing with the Psalms and in Romans. Mm. Yeah, excellent. So, so, yes, I do think that this is a really uh, useful treatment for the pastor, and uh, I, I trust that the Lord is going to use this uh, for great good in days to come. Now, when you think of uh, the other, uh, you're talking about commentaries that you thought are the best commentaries. Just give me a little list of uh, those that you would find to be your most faithful friends as you work through Romans yourself. Yeah, as I said in, in my commentary, I couldn't help but put my top initially 25 favorite commentaries out of the 140 I read every week, but it just 
grew progressively. So in my commentary, uh, I list the top 30, but I've got them here. So I've got, of course, John Murray. You've got to start with John Murray for doctrine. Uh, excellent. Really uh, waxes eligantly, especially on sanctification. Romans 6, he just gets it right. Romans 7 gets it right. Douglas Moo. I really like Moo. I think he does an excellent job on the Greek text. Very lucid in his comments. Easy to read. Uh, really, really helpful. Uh, Tom Schreiner, I think really good. Um, a nice standalone commentary. If you just had to get, you know, a few, those three guys would probably be my top. Uh, Leon Morris, I love Leon Morris. He, he writes like a preacher. He's always giving you stuff that you need. Uh, no no uh, chaff there, just wheat. Uh, a new one that I just got maybe a year or so ago, John Harvey. Uh, that's in the egg and T, that is to say the E-G-G-N-T. Excellent on the Greek text. So, uh, if you don't have Cranfield, uh, you would get John Harvey. Now, I had Cranfield, not that I bought it, uh, but I had it. I did not use it. Cranfield had liberal tendencies, so I did not want to use him. But a lot of solid guys use Cranfield uh, because he was great on the Greek text. However, if you want a solid evangelical, uh, John Harvey on the Greek text, really good. Colin Cruz and the Pillar commentary, good. Uh, David Garland, that commentary came out. Uh, about a year and a half ago. I really like David Garland. Excellent in the uh, Tyndale series. Uh, Frank uh, Feynman, uh, very good in the Zondervan exegetical. Charles Hodge, there you have it. Uh, and then for number 10, I've got uh, John MacArthur. So really like uh, MacArthur again. He's preachy and has got some good stuff in there. Uh, while, of course, I would disagree with him on Romans chapter 11. Everywhere else, he was pretty good. So there you have it, my top 10. That gives an excellent summary of where you're coming from and, and what perspectives are in making the presentation. I think of even uh, Joel Beakey comments as he says, Ventura's thoroughly reformed exposition of Paul's greatest epistle is packed full of insights for preachers and teachers of God's word. His approach strikes an excellent balance. He discusses the details of each verse without getting overly technical. He quotes great theologians of the Augustinian reformed tradition while letting the scriptures speak for themselves. His commentary is theoretical doctrinal, and warmly practical, containing helpful elements for both believers and unbelievers at the end of every section. That's a pretty encouraging evaluation from Dr. Beakey. Mm, very thankful. I was just on a long call with him the other night on a board meeting call, and uh, he was encouraged with, uh, of course, this book. I'm thankful they'll be carrying it, but also the 1689 they said it sold um, just an amazing amount of books through them as well. So grateful. You know, one thing, uh, Mark, as I wrote this book, I thought, you know, about guys, for example, in Africa. I had the privilege to preach in Africa last year at um, Conrad's uh, conference there with uh, Vodi Balcom and also our dear friend Ronald Califungo. I know you've been there as well. And I'm thinking about guys in Africa. They don't have the money that I have to buy 140 commentaries. They don't have the time to read all this stuff. If I had to give them a one-stop shop commentary where all the outlines were done, all of the Greek was done, all of the applications were done, and I quote from the best sources out there, um, I would recommend my commentary. Not again, because it's the best or others aren't better, that's not the point. But as a one-stop shop, if you had to have just one volume and you couldn't afford you know, the many volumes, I would recommend the book. So I, I, I wrote it for guys like that in mind, who again, might not have the uh, large library that I do by God's grace. And this way they can say, man, with this one resource, I'm having my mind and my heart and my sermon uh, open to all kind of good instruction from others in days gone by. Yeah, I, I Rob, I, I did a recent job at our house uh, with plumbing, and I went off to Menards, and you're walking on the aisles there, and you see, oh, look at that. There's this, there's this new invention they have for interlocking the pipes together. Oh, that's so creative, and that's so helpful. It's such a time saver, such mm. a product. I, I kind of look at your, your commentary that way, in the mind of the pastor who's trying to put together a God-honoring sermon. Like you write early on in the preface, you say, well, Romans is a well-served letter. Surprisingly, I didn't find many resources that gave me quick, accessible, expository nuggets to help me prepare Greek-informed, hermeneutically sound, and homiletically clean sermons in time for preaching each week. Further, I noticed that few of the commentaries I used had any real practical and pointed applications to help bring home the truths of the text 
to the hearts and minds of my hearers. To address these matters, I wrote the book that you're now reading. Well, that's it, you know, and I had a really good hermeneutics professor who really stressed some of these things to me, and that professor was yours truly, Mark Chansky, so. Well, I, I, I tell you, you know, you have, you have students that make your heart sing, and you are certainly uh, one of those students, and I, I thank you for what he's done in helping you to craft this particular work. Uh, thank you. Yes, Rob. What about the, the pastor's or the preacher's use of commentaries? You know, in, in recent days, there's been, a, I think, in some ways healthy, an emphasis on the importance of personal exposition. Mm -hmm. But I think there are times when there maybe is an unhealthy downplaying of commentaries, as if somehow using commentaries is, is cheating, as there's such an emphasis on original and personal interpretation. Give me your thoughts on that. I think they're extremes, right? So um, coming out of a broader evangelical setting, as I did many, many years ago, you know, really, you know, if you use commentaries, it's kind of looked at as anti-spiritual because those settings were kind of anti-intellectual. We're not really reading scholars. We're just trusting God to give us a word for this message, et cetera. So that's one extreme. And then on the other extreme, again, us reform guys, we love to read, et cetera. So maybe we're too heavy uh, with the reading and not, again, just looking to the Lord first and foremost with reference to what God would give us as pastors and ministers. I, I think the answer is, is not either or extreme, really, but, but somewhere in the middle. We always begin by praying and seeking the face of God. We always begin by doing our own exegesis, our own outlines, all that kind of stuff. So I don't want anything I wrote to supplement that with men. I just hope it will enhance it. It'll be uh, just adding flavor to what they've done. They'll take what I uh, wrote and they'll make it better. There might be a seed thought that I would give them and then they would develop it, much like the, the pulpit commentary or the preacher's homiletical commentary. Those are homiletical tools that get your juices going. You're like, oh yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And then they develop it. So, you know, for me, I think uh, you, we always need to begin with, Lord, I need you to help me with this message. The last place I go is my commentaries. It's always after prayer, after I do all my own exegesis, after I do all of my work, I know what the text is saying, then I check the commentators just as a kind of a check and balance for myself to see, you know, is what I'm seeing in the text anything else or anything that anyone else is seeing or has seen over the decades? And 99% of the time, it's all the same. That's the beautiful symmetry when it comes to the Spirit of God and how He's worked uh, over the years giving truth to the church. One time I was speaking to Warren Worsby. Remember Warren Worsby? The old... Yeah, the old Bible commentator. I'm not sure if you're coming in, Mark. I'm not hearing you in my ear. Say it one more time. I got you now. Yeah. Um, so Warren Worsby, I was talking to him on a, a phone conversation one time, and I, I said to him, uh, so, so what, what's your perspective when it comes to using commentaries? And he said, Rob, he says, when it comes to using commentaries, I like to say, we all milk from many cows, but we make our own butter. <laughs> so, you know, so Warren Worsby, vintage. Yeah, oh, yeah, classic. So, so again, we, we, we check the commentators, and they're, they're a check and balance for us. Is, is what I'm saying here new? There's nothing new under the heavenly. So if it's new, you might really want to question, you know, is this something that is new? I mean, surely somebody would have seen this over the years. And as I said, 99% of the time, uh, I'm not called to be an originator. I'm called to be a communicator. I'm called to, uh, to be a proclaimer of God's truth. And I love doing all my own studies. And then again, I check the guys and there's everyone saying pretty much everything I've said. And I feel comfortable with that because again, there's a, a stream of truth. There is that, that body of divinity, which God has given to us in his word. And it's for all of us as God's people. So that's how we approach commentaries. And I think that's the general plan when we use them, not to be slaves to the commentaries, no. But after we've done our own work, we check them as helpers to assist us in uh, confirming what God has shown us already. Good, that's good. Paul, what, <laughs> Paul I, keep, I think, keep thinking of you're writing with Jeremy Walker, uh, Paul and his uh, portrait and spiritual warfare. Rob, yeah. what about, what about Romans for 2023? What, why is Roman such an outstanding focus as opposed to oh, First Corinthians or Ephesians? I know even when you had that uh, title of the book and you got the cover of the book and you got that picture of the 
the Colosseum, and then you've got the, the clouds around the Colosseum and uh, echoing the theme of those who've been martyred in the great cloud of witnesses. Tell me, why Romans for 2023? Yeah, it's a great question, Mark. I think we find ourselves in a similar situation to the early believers, right? Uh, in that sense, uh, you know, Christianity was outlawed and it was illegal to, you know, proclaim the things of God, etc. We may be going there in our own country. It's becoming... Say it one more time, Mark. Oh, well, it seems like we're there right now. We just had a, a gay pride festival in the Centennial Park in Holland, Michigan, and just staggering to see how far we've gone since I, 29 years ago, came to Holland. Yeah, it's Romans 1 all over again. And so we need to know how to communicate that gospel. Additionally, with, uh, along with communicating the gospel, Paul's main theme of Romans is set forth in uh, 1, 16 and 17. We've got Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as Christians, we're constantly in this melting pot and the world is constantly trying to squeeze us into its mold. And we need to be able to resist that, but resist it in a way that honors God and seeks to bring forward the glorious gospel of Christ. So, you know, Romans, as I say here in my preface to the book, uh, you know, supremely showcases the central doctrines of the Christian faith. And, and everything is in Romans, you know, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of salvation, uh, uh, the doctrine of God's sovereignty. And then again, Romans 12, as I just said, the doctrine of service, service in the church and, and service in the world, service in the government, uh, Romans 13. Uh, so many, many topics that are so practical to us as God's people are contained in this glorious epistle. That's such a timely work. I even think of uh, preaching last week on I'm not ashamed of the gospel for us. Mm. First for the Jew and for the Gentile, for in it a righteousness of God is made known. And how, how crucial this is in this day when really the gospel is outdated in the minds of many outmoded and so we need to adapt and we need to bring a, a new message to men how somehow mm -hmm. jesus can bring you self-fulfillment in your life mm -hmm. as opposed to the real focus of like it says for the wrath of god is being revealed against the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness it's not god loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life god mm -hmm. is angry with you mm -hmm. and to redeem to be redeemed from the effects of your sins. That's well said. Yeah, the gospel is for all people in every generation. And uh, what a privilege it is that we've been given the stewardship to proclaim that most excellent message. Yeah, and what about the eschatological position? I mean, you get to uh, Romans uh, 11 and we start talking about eschatology. Give me your perspectives on that, Rob. Are you, you're an all mill man, I trust yourself. That's true, yeah, and I would just qualify it by saying optimistic, uh, millenarian. Uh, you know, there's a big move in our day uh, with a lot of the Reformed guys, Reformed Baptist guys as well, you know, becoming post-mill. I'm not quite comfortable with going uh, to the post-mill position. I just think it's uh, too optimistic, too golden age-y for me. Um, and yet, it, uh, while doing that, it, it neglects, I think, a lot of scriptures um, and yet on the other side, of course, you got, you know, dispensational pre-mill, which is very negative. So on the one hand, one's very negative and one is ultra, we might even say supra uh, positive. But I think the optimistic amillenarian position really, it, it balances all, it holds in tension all that the Bible says, like our Lord said that um, the wheat and the chaff will grow together, that uh, wickedness will continue to rise uh, in the world as we're seeing, as you mentioned earlier with that um, you know, phenomenon happening in the park by you, but at the same time, the gospel is going forth in ways that we have never seen it. Explosions of the gospel in Brazil and Africa and Cuba, Colombia. So it's a glorious thing. So uh, yes, I'm an optimistic amillenarian, uh, like you said, and the prophet said, the, the knowledge of the Lord is spreading across the world as the waters cover the earth. So that's a glorious, glorious thing. So how do I now bring that to Romans 11? All Israel will be saved. So um, I make a, a, a little keyhole glimpse of what you're going to say there. 
Yeah, so I take, um, you know, Romans 11, of course, historically is a very difficult chapter to interpret. Um, one thing with this commentary, I have about 1,500 footnotes, so I would encourage all the readers to read the footnotes. I generally don't like reading footnotes myself, but I didn't want the commentary itself to be 1,500 pages, so I stuck a lot in the footnotes. But one thing I say in Romans 11, really from Romans 9 uh, to the end of 11, is that, you know, I'm a Jewish believer, like, you know, half my family is Jewish. And so there's nothing here that I'm saying that is anti-Jewish, anything like that, as Paul wasn't anti-Jewish. As you know, when he goes to preach, he first goes to the synagogues to preach Jesus as Messiah. So there's nothing I say there that's anti-Jewish. But I've got to stick close to the text, and I don't believe that when Paul says all Israel will be saved, that he's speaking of uh, ethnic Israel, uh, that there's going to be this you know, great end time in gathering of all the Jews, et cetera. Now, I know uh, there are people who believe that, and uh, certainly our Puritan forefathers, many of them did as well, the Puritan hope, et cetera. Uh, I say, as a footnote, I say, now, if that happens, that's great. And I say, this is an acceptable position. It's not one I'm, you know, uh, denouncing in any way, shape, or form. I think we need to be very careful with that. Everything I say in Romans 11 is very ironic. I just said, I don't believe that's what Paul's saying there. I believe that when he's speaking about all Israel, at the end of chapter 11, he's speaking about the Israel that he mentioned earlier in Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 to 11 becomes an inclusio where he says not all Israel is Israel. There is an Israel within Israel. Elect Israel, those are the all Israel that will be saved. That's Paul's point. So you either have it as all ethnic Israel will be saved. I can't believe that every single Jew uh, who's, let's say, not converted or whatever the case is, they just have the the sign of circumcision in their member that all of a sudden Jesus is going to come back, they're going to get saved. No, uh, I don't believe all Israel is referring to both Jew and Gentile. That was Calvin's view, um, that they're all going to be saved because that's just uh, obvious. Obviously, all elect are going to be saved. But I believe Paul is answering his initial question uh, with reference to um, all Israel being elect Israel, that those are the people who will be saved. So then all Israel will be saved. All the elect among ethnic Israel will be saved. And my position, I actually think it's more glorious than this end time and gathering because Paul is saying that all throughout history, God is going to keep saving Jewish believers, just as he's doing even up to this present time, Paul says. Paul mentions nothing about the future in Romans 11, by the way. He says, but now, 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 it's all present. So what he's saying is, is that God as he continues to save elect Gentiles throughout the centuries, he's going to continue to save elect Jews all throughout the ages until Christ returns. So to me, that's much more glorious than saying, well, now he's just saving the Gentiles and maybe a few Jews here and there, but then there's going to be this big thing. Now, as I say in my footnote, if that's how it works out, I'm fine with that. And nothing I say really uh, kicks against it. But I think as I work through the verses, as I work through the verses, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, my conclusion did not quite go there, but um, there you have it. Rob. Hey, Rob, our time is about gone. Any, any final note you want to sound before we sign off? Well, besides the fact I'm very grateful that you guys had me on the, um, the podcast, super grateful for that. And I just pray the commentary will be a blessing to ministers around the world, that it will be a real help for them to proclaim and explain uh, the wonderful transforming truths of the book of Romans. All right. Blessings, brother. May the Lord bless you, keep you, turn his face toward you, and grant you peace. Godspeed.